Uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the time of worship we were able to share. Lord, it's so good to worship you for so many different things that you are. You save. You're worthy of our praise. You became a man to dwell amongst us, Lord. You went to the cross to die for our sins. You are the Messiah. God, there's so much, and we can have that time of peacefully worshiping you, reminding ourselves and each other of what you have done in our lives and for us, that you want all of our life, not just a portion, not just a little bit, but all of it. And God, it's good to sing together and remind ourselves of what you have done to to earn that besides being God himself. You don't need to earn it. But then you went and died for us anyway. God, you are good to us. And pray as we open your word now, you would remind us of these things and help us to focus on what you would desire us to do. We pray this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week we almost finished chapter 19. What is this, number four or something like that to get through chapter 19? But we will finish it today, which is good. We only got four verses left. But you know, the thing, about, the thing about this last week, we've entered into the last week of Jesus' life. We spent over a year looking at the life of Christ from in Luke chapter 1 all the way to where we are. And the rest of this book is about these last few weeks, or last week, and then when he rises again, the few days after that and stuff. But this it focuses on this last week of Jesus' life, often called the Passion Week. Now, as you read it, a lot of times it can be a little bit confusing Uh, because you read one Matthew, or you read Mark, or you read Luke, and it it seems like they kind of all go together. You know, in in our our text today, Jesus is weeping over Jerusalem in verse 41. He he stops. Remember, we talked about that last week. And he's weeping because the nation, they don't realize, or they're rejecting, the fact that he wants to bring peace to their life, and they're rejecting that. And so he's weeping over the fact that he, he has such peace for them to experience and yet they will not bow their knee and worship him or, or follow him. And so he weeps over the nation. And then it goes right in, in verse 45, that he went into the temple and began to drive out, began to cleanse the temple. So just to qu- really quickly, I just want to give a, a picture of what actually is going on this week. Because uh, in order for us to gather uh, a good understanding of it. On, on Sunday, the problem, one of the problems that we have is that the Jewish day starts at sundown the night before. So Sunday starts Saturday night uh, at sundown. And so it's a little bit difficult sometimes to get to all these things in our minds. But Sunday, it starts with the anointing of Bethany on Saturday night, then the triumphal entry. And what he does is he goes in and he just looks over the temple. He doesn't do anything. He just goes in and looks at it. And then on Monday... Monday is what he goes in and he curses the fig tree because it doesn't have any fruit. And Monday is the day he cleanses the temple. And and not only does he cleanse the temple, but he heals the lame. He gives sight to the blind. Some great things go on on Monday. And then he goes out again. He goes out to Bethany every night to stay at Bethany, uh, to stay with uh, Lazarus and his family and things, Simon the leper. And then on on Tuesday, he comes back in and he sees the fig tree withered and talks about faith and those kinds of things to the disciples. And then he goes into the temple and Tuesday is the big day. Tuesday is the day that most of this is going to be dealing with where they're questioning him. He's giving parables. They're, they're, they're challenging him and all these different things. This is where he talks about taxes and giving to Caesar and, and the different parables that he speaks. That's all going on on Tuesday. Uh, that happens. It's a big day. It's the day of questioning that happens. And then uh, the next one, it goes on to Wednesday. And and again, Tuesday evening, he goes out to the the Mount of Olives. He sits down. It becomes the evening, which was Wednesday. And it starts the Olivet Discourse, uh, Matthew 24 and 25. All that happens on Wednesday evening. And then they go, they stay overnight. And then in the morning, the Sanhedrin assembles and they're trying to kill Jesus, but they don't want to do it on the Passover. And all of that is taking place on Wednesday. Uh, and then Thursday is a preparation day. They prepare for Passover, and then Friday is the Last Supper in the evening, and then the the night, the Garden of Gethsemane, the arrest, the crucifixion. And so as you read these things, it seems like they're all shoved together or out of, but they're not really. It's just sort of like Luke wants to pull out certain things to help him, to help us understand his point, you know, that he would understand that what he what he's uh, trying to put across. John's got a message. Luke's got a message. They all, all got different things to bring out. And so in Luke, it says that, you know, he weeps over Jerusalem and then it goes straight into cleansing the temple. Verse 45, it says, then he went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in it. 
saying to them, It is written, My house is a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And he was teaching daily in the temple, but the chief priests and scribes and the leaders of the people sought to destroy him and were unable to do anything for all the people were very attentive to hear him. And so he starts that Monday morning, he gets up, he comes in, and he just cleans house. The night before, he'd, he'd come in as king. Remember, they, the people were welcoming him. They came out to meet him on the road, and John tells us that they had heard what he did with Lazarus. And because of that, they came out to welcome him as king. He, he brought a man back from the dead. And not just somebody that died that day, but someone who had been dead and in the grave for four days. And so Jesus brings him back to life. The people heard about it and they meet Jesus. John tells us that. That was one of the major reasons why they all came out to meet him. And so he goes into the temple. He looks around. He sees what's going on in the temple and, and then goes out. And then now we get into verse 45. He begins to clean house. Now this is the second time he does it. Now this is sort of a picture of the temple or a model of what it might have looked like. And we don't know if that's exactly how it looked. Here's another one. It's a little bit different. As you can see, there's a building over here where there wasn't in the last one. And they don't really know exactly all that was up there. They know some and they kind of have ideas. But because the, the, the Romans were so <laughs> thorough in destroying it and the Muslims have been up there since, you know, that there's really not, they don't, can't do archaeological digs and things like that. So there's different ideas of how it looked in some cases. But this one... I like because it gives us sort of a picture of where, where if everything is exactly like that, I don't know. But this is, this is the court of the Gentiles here. This is the area. If you're a Gentile and you're not Jewish, you can come, you can come to this area here. Uh, it's not working. You can come to that area up there or you can come around here to this other side as well. So that's where you can go if you are not Jewish. If you're Jewish and you're a woman, you can go inside this building area here, but you can't go beyond a certain gate. If you're a man, you can go in close to the temple, but you can't go into the temple itself. There's always distance in it. But this is the place that if you wanted to go and meet God, this is where you would come. And so here they are, the, 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 the nations are gathering, the, the, the Gentiles are coming. It says there are Greeks there in, in, in John's gospel. And, and so you have the Greeks that are coming, meeting in the court of the Gentiles. You have women that are coming and going into the court of Israel, or the court of the women, and then uh, the men that can go in all the way. And what had happened is that these religious leaders, the Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, the high priest, there was two of them at the time, they were setting up these these booths to sell and trade in the court of the Gentiles. And this was the area, this is, if you weren't Jewish, this is as close to God as you could get. This is where you would go to meet with God, to spend time with him, to pray. And this was the place that they set up all of this, all of these, these booths and things and, and tables to change money and to sell sacrifices that were uh, approved by the high priest. And so they had filled that place. And Jesus comes in and he begins to just kick them all out, you know, to get rid of them. Because they were standing in the way of people coming to know God. Now, the, the problem was, it wasn't wrong necessarily to change money. And it wasn't wrong necessarily to sell um, lambs and goats and things like that. But not in the temple and not at the way that they were doing it because they were doing it if you came and you, you brought your lamb or you bought your lamb, you wanted to get a cheaper price, you bought it in Bethany and not at the temple, they would you know, inspect it and say, well, it has a blemish, you can't have that one. You need to, you need to buy one of these approved temple approved um, lambs or goats or whatever you're going to offer, turtle doves. And, but the problem is they would raise the prices quite a high. And so they were stealing, basically, from the people. That's why he says a den of thieves. They were stealing from the people who had a heart to come and worship God. And they were saying, well, come worship God. Uh, just you need to pay a little extra to do it. And, and obviously God didn't like that. And so much so that at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he had cleaned the temple once. John talks about it, chapter 2, that he had cleaned out the temple and three years later, they had come back in. Three years later, they had restarted and re redoing it all. So Jesus comes in again and cleanses the temple again, that area, the court of the Gentiles, well, where they were selling and getting rid of it all. Now, the problem was that God had already said in his word that he was to take care of the priests and the Levites from the tithes and offerings that the people would bring. They were to be taken care of. 
Well, the problem is there wasn't, they, they wouldn't really become wealthy off that. And so in order for them to become wealthy, they had to do these extra things to get more money. Now, this was something that was continuous throughout the time of Israel. Way back in Eli, the, the beginning of Samuel, Eli's sons were, were, were using a three-pronged hook. They were allowed to use a two-pronged hook. You brought your food, you would cook it, and they could ting, take a two-pronged hook, they could stab the meat, and whatever came up in that meat, they could take for themselves. That was their, that was their pay. That was, the, that was part of their, their, their provision. But these guys didn't like that. They used a three-prong hook because they can get a lot more with that. So they would come and, and they would use a three-prong hook and take out more of the meat. And that wasn't enough. And so these guys, Eli's sons, they began to say, okay, give it to us before you, uh, before you burn the fat, before you cook it. We want your meat raw. And they're like, we well, are supposed to cook it. I said, don't care. We want it raw. I want to cook it myself. My wife does a better job than you do. You know, those kinds of things. And, and the people, people were like, I don't want to be here anymore. I don't want to come worship God. And so the people began to no longer want to worship God because of the high priest and the, his sons. Well, not the high priest so much, but his sons, that they were not obeying and walking with God. And, and that was carried on. You read throughout the, the Jeremiah and Isaiah, you read about it and how they're, they're constantly stealing and taking from the people. And, and here at the time of Christ, the same thing. Maybe in just a different way, but another way to steal from the people of God. Now, the great thing about that, that never happens anymore from people trying to take from the people of God, you know, ever, does it? I, I had a few that I was going to show you, actually, about people who do that still today, but uh, I thought I'd spare you the uh, insulting images that you would see. You know, I think I've shown one before about Creflo Dollar and how he would, him and his guest speaker were dancing on the money that people were bringing and throwing at their feet at the, on the stairs and he would anoint them by walking on this money and anoint the, what you're doing. Another, woman, another guy called Bishop, um, Bishop Long, he, he was preaching and there's a video of him and some woman walks up and hands him like a wad of money this much. You know, and of course they, they show her on camera all the way back to her chair, you know. And, and, and it's just all of this, you know, trying to get more and more and more and more out of the people. It still happens today. It's a sad thing to see that that is taking place today. You know, Kenneth Copeland and all the rest of them that continually do that. You know, he, he flies around in a $20 million jet, you know. I mean, the fastest jet you can possibly, you can buy is a private jet. That's what Kenneth Copeland has. And how did he get that? Because people bought his stuff and sent it in, and, and he would take and take and take. And, and, and you, one after another, you can see these things of how these people are living and how they're living off people's desire to just worship and know God and experience God. I want to experience God. If I send money into that and get that particular water and that little piece of salt, then I'll put it on my check, and, that, and he's promising God's going to bless me. Because that I've done that. Peter Popoff is the one doing that even today. And if you don't know him, he in the 80s he got busted uh, by he was having an earpiece and his wife was feeding him information that she had gathered at the door. She would stand at the door and say, "How are you doing? Oh, where do you live? You know, and what sort of problems do you have today?" And she would write it all down and then she would go in the back and feed him this information through a, a speaker. And it actually you, you can listen to it on. Somebody had a scanner one at one of his meetings and caught her doing it. And, and, and he was this, this preacher in the 80s that he got busted doing that, saying, this is from God. I can see angels around your house. He would give them their address and everything. And they were like, wow, this is amazing. And all the while, she was giving him this information. Well, 20 years later, he's back on the scene. In 2007, he made $25 million off people by selling these spring waters and this bag of salt that if you sprinkle on his on your check that you send him, then he, you will be blessed by these kinds of things. This kind of stuff is still going on today. It's a horrible thing. I wonder what God says. Here, well, this is what he says. It's written, my house is a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. A den of thieves. A den is a place to hide for thieves. And now the house of God is a place in Jesus' time where these guys that were hiding behind the religious ideas were becoming extremely wealthy on these poor people that were coming to the Lord. And they were hindering what God wanted to do. So what does Jesus do? He doesn't come in and just say, well, this is not a good idea. He comes in and beats them and kicks them out, takes a whip and kicks them out, turns over their tables. I mean... 
you would look at him and go, wait a second, he was just weeping over the nation and now he's kicking these guys out. And this is the thing. You know, when you, when you stand before God and you say that you are a, a servant of God, whether you are, uh, have a title or whether you just say you are a Christian, and then you do things that are contrary to what God wants to, God wants to do and the, and the witness that he wants to bring through you, I, I think we need to be careful about that. Because in this sense... These guys were a den of thieves. He comes in, beats them, and sends them out. Well, at the beginning of chapter 19, we had met another thief, Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus also was a thief, but he wasn't standing in the temple taking people, taking from people who are wanting to worship God. And Zacchaeus, he eats with him. He, he goes to his house and eats because he sees Zacchaeus' heart that wants to change. These guys, they didn't want to change, and he just throws them out of the temple. And it was after that, it was after he cleans that whole area there of the, uh, uh, the court of the Gentiles that Matthew tells us that the blind and the lame would come to Jesus in the temple and he would heal them. And he, just think about that picture. Here they are. The place has become a place of commerce. They're making lots of money off it. And these people are coming. And Annas and, and, and Caiaphas and the, the families are becoming wealthy All the while, the blind and the lame are outside the temple, not being touched, not being healed. Jesus comes in, casts them all out. The blind and the lame come in. Now, I think that's important because we don't have a temple today, do we? We don't have a temple to uh, go to because in 1 Corinthians, if it turns there, we're told that we are the temple of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? And you are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now, this is for every Christian. If you say that you're a Christian, or if I say that I'm a Christian, I can't say, I don't want to be a temple of the Holy Spirit today. I want to go and do what I want to do. And he says, you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, we look at guys like Creflo Dollar, like I mentioned, and Peter Popoff, and all these guys, and how how dare they do those things. That's horrible, and it is. But this is talking about the temple of God being each and every one of us. And we wonder why sometimes that people aren't being healed or aren't being saved or the blind aren't being able to see. Well, are there things in our temple that are actually hindering what God wants to do through our lives? I think it's a fair question to ask. Here it says that he is, that you are, and I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. God wants to move through his people. God wanted to save China, but God didn't move too much in China until Hudson Taylor went and other people followed. God wants to move through people who will sacrifice and say, I will just say, I I want God to be all in all in me and that I will not let anything get in the way of people coming to meet with God because we are taking the temple to them. This building, and if we get a building of our own, it's not a temple, It's, it's it's a place where we meet. If this was our own building, it still is not holy ground. Maybe other people would disagree with that, but I don't believe in holy ground and unholy ground. Uh, Holy ground is wherever you are as the church. We are the church of Christ. We are holy because Christ has made that. And so wherever we go, we are that holy area that people are looking at. They are looking at you and I as Christians saying, are you really a place where I can meet with God? Are you really a place where God is going to speak to me from? A place where a, 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 a place of prayer. My house is a house of prayer. These guys were getting in the way. Commerce was getting in the way of a place for people to come and worship God. Is there anything in my life that's getting in the way of me seeking my Lord? Well, Jesus says, let's get rid of it. He goes into the temple and shows it and just casts it out. And when he does, the blind see the lame are able to walk. Worth, worth, worth checking at least. But then in verse 47, he says, and he was teaching daily in the temple. But the chief priests and the scribes and the leaders of the people sought to destroy him and were unable to do anything for all the people were very attentive. And so Jesus is spending these days teaching in the temple. Now this picture, uh, 
Um, let's see. It's going pretty slow today. This picture here is this, uh, the temple with these steps down here. You can kind of see them here on the left side. Those are called the southern steps. This is, this is the, the way to the, uh, the Mount of Olives is over here. The city of David is down here in this way. And these are the southern steps up to the temple. The western wall is on the back side of the temple that we know today. And so these are the southern steps. These are the actual picture of the southern steps. You can go to Jerusalem. Roy and Rosemary will be leading a, a, a group there next year. You can go with them and they'll take you to the southern steps and they'll show you these are, if there's one place in Israel that you would say Jesus was here, this is it. He, he would have walked up these steps. It's pretty awesome to think. And, t- and often they would, rabbis would stand in these, t- these steps and teach. And so Jesus might have stood on these steps teaching at this time. He might have been up on the Temple Mount. We don't exactly know where he was, but he was there at the temple. And he was teaching. He was proclaiming. He was, he was uh, giving out the gospel. It says in verse 1, now it happened in verse 20. On one of those days as he taught the people in the temple and preached the gospel that the chief priests and scribes together with the elders confronted him. Now we know this is the next day. This is Tuesday. And they spoke saying, tell us by what authority are you doing these things? Or who is he who gave you this authority? And so here Jesus is, is walking in the temple he, he might be there on those steps. He might be up on the Temple Mount in the court of the Gentiles, but he's teaching and preaching the gospel. What was he teaching and preaching? Well, perhaps in John 12, this, this happened during this week. He says, a little while longer, the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of the light. Now, John 12, this comes from this week. Wherever, I don't know if it was on this very day that he said these things, but it came during this week that Jesus was proclaiming this and calling to the nation, calling to Israel, the Gentiles, and saying, hey, this is the moment for you to have the light turned on. Walk in the light unless darkness overtake you. Because there seems to be a thing that, that the more you hear about the gospel, the more you hear about Jesus dying for our sins, and the more that you hear about his resurrection and the power of God in your life, and the, the more you reject that, the, 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 the greater the darkness becomes in our life, the harder our hearts become to receiving it. You, you see these guys. I mean, who had, some people say that we need to have, just have more power evangelism. We need more miracles and stuff. Well, yeah, that would be great, but you can't get more miracles than Jesus did. You know, he raised the dead. You know, he, he, he was here in the temple the day before. A blind man would walk towards Jesus. He would lay hands on him. That man would go away seeing. The next person would come up. Well, they would have to carry him. He was lame, and he would touch him, and he would get up and walk. This went on all afternoon. He, it wasn't just one or two. It was several. And, and yet, the very next day, they're coming to him saying, on what authority have you done these things? All Jesus is saying is saying, hey, walk in the light. The kingdom of God has come. It's time to give your life to him. And and they're saying, what authority do you have these things? Now, them asking that question isn't necessarily wrong. They were the religious authority. They needed to to make sure that he was right and things. And so Jesus answers him with 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 a valid point. Verse three, but he answers and said to them, I also will ask you one thing and answer me. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? And they reasoned among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why then did you not believe him? But if we say from men, all the people will stone us, for they persuaded that John was a prophet. So they answered, for they did not know where it was from. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Now, Jesus gives them that answer. They, they come and say, What authority have you done? Okay, except for the fact that I wrote on the, the exact day I was supposed to ride into Jerusalem, fulfilling Zechariah as well as Daniel. Uh, as, uh, besides the fact that I just healed all these blind people and all these lame people, besides, besides the fact that that's Lazarus over here and he was dead four days and now he's standing here, you know, besides all of those things, besides the fact that I was born of a virgin and in Bethlehem and Nazareth and Egypt and, you know, as we went in last week and talked about all those things that he did, besides all of those things, what have you done? Well, John tells us this very week 
that the voice of God proclaimed that this is his beloved son. So the voice of God spoke and said, this is my beloved son on that very week. The people around were going, uh, it thundered. Or someone else said, an angel spoke to him. And Jesus says, this, was, this voice wasn't for me, it was for you. And so during the very week that they're saying these things, he's healing the blind, giving, uh, able to raise the, the leper off the floor, or the, the lame off the floor. He's able to have the, God's voice uh, testify to him. He's, he's done all the prophecy stuff, and they still will not believe him. They still want one more thing. And I like what Jesus does. Jesus doesn't give them one more thing. He points them back and says, what about John? What happened? What do you think about John the Baptist? Well, the message of John the Baptist, the method, message of John the Baptist, you can turn back and Luke a few, few pages, and you can read about it. In Luke chapter 3, Verse 2, it says, While Annas and Caiaphas were the high priests, just as I've been saying, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled. Every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked Places shall be made straight. The rough ways smooth on all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Then he said to the, mul- the multitudes that, you, that, that came up to be baptized by him, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance and do not begin to say to yourself, we have Abraham as our father. And he goes on and he's explained about the changed life in each person and how they were to, 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 to show the, that they were repentant. And so his message, well, his message was to be baptized for the remission of sins, for a baptism of repentance. The people were to repent and realize that they have gone a wrong way, and they were to wait for the promised Messiah that was going to come. That was his message. And so what does it say there? Well, again, Luke not only points back to John the Baptist, but he goes further back and says John the Baptist is also a fulfillment of prophecy. And so I I love that. Because so many times we're wanting a new word, whether we're a Christian or not a Christian. If we're not a Christian, we ask God to show us if he's real. And all of a sudden he does something that no one can really know that it should happen. He speaks to me and he he does something. I pray that you would do this. And he does it. And you're, whoa, that was weird. Okay, uh, that's not enough. Can you do one more thing? You know, and that's what the people in in Jesus' time were doing. Jesus feeds the 5,000 men plus women and children the very next day, they say, what sign are you going to do to prove that you're God? Um, it, there's always one more thing. And in, in, in a Christian, there's always often one more thing too. Just give me one more confirmation that this is what I'm supposed to do. Give me a new sign or a new thing. Or I want a new, fresh work of the Spirit in my life. And I'll be honest with you. There have been times where I have done that. In fact, when I was in Morocco this past time, I'm like, Lord... I'll come, you know, send me, here I am, you know, I'll go to Morocco, and there I am, and I'm praying about it, the doors are opening, and I'm like, man, give me a fresh word, then I'll go, you know, and I'm sitting there thinking about it and stuff, and and God's not speaking, he's not saying anything new, I'm like, Lord, come on, you know, 40 million Muslims, they need the Lord, come on, here I am, I'll come, and he's like, and nothing happens, so I'm like, okay, well, let me go back to what God has already said to me. So I went back to already what he had said to me in the past about my life and what I should be doing. And I went back to what I had already, what God had already spoken to me about. And it says, you know, in, in, in Timothy, it says, fulfill your ministry. And I read that and all of a sudden it dropped in my heart. I, I haven't fulfilled my ministry yet. It's not time for me to go anywhere else. So why should I be asking for the new move or the new word or the new this instead of actually fulfilling what God has already said in my life? And, and is, is that us? Is there someone here wanting God to show me something new when he's already told us something to do and we're not even doing that? Well, let's go back and do that. And once we fulfill that, God will then lead us on to the next thing. The Pharisees were saying the same thing. Give us some word of authority. Give us some, tell us how, who, what. And Jesus was like, oh, let's look back at the previous. I've already given you this. I said it in Isaiah John the Baptist, I fulfilled it. 
God has spoken. The voice of God has happened twice. I've done all the miracles. Uh, you know, I, what more do you need? Well, one more thing. And then I'll serve God. I hope we're not like that. I hope we're not always making that excuse why I'm not doing those things that God spoke to me to do just because I want one more confirmation to do what he's already told me to do. And so they reasoned, saying, well, if we say this, that it's from heaven, why didn't they believe him? If we say it's from man, well, the people are going to stone us because they think it's from God. And so they think they play the safe route. They don't make a decision. They, they were good politicians, you know, just sort of played the middle of the road. And he said, neither will I tell you what authority I do these things. And so Jesus doesn't tell him, except that Jesus does tell him at another time. In John chapter 12, he didn't tell them at the, that question, but he had told some of his disciples, for I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that he commanded, he commanded, his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. And so during this week, he did tell him that uh, his authority comes from the Father. That what he is speaking comes from the Father, not from him. And so he says that these kinds of things, but the, 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 the nation, they're just not going to believe. They come up with one thing after another after another. And the whole point of it is that they did not want to give up their position. That was the top and bottom of it. I don't want Jesus to be Lord because if he's Lord, I have to bow my head and I have to actually ask him if I'm allowed to do this or that. I have to ask him if he wants me to go and do that or to go there and do that. All of a sudden, I'm not Lord anymore. God is Lord. And a lot of people don't want that. We don't want to hear those things. Well, they didn't want to hear those things because they thought that the Romans would come and take their position. Well, Jesus has some harsh words. Verse 9. Then he began to tell the people this parable. A certain man planted a vineyard leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country for a long time. Now as vintage time, uh, uh, he sent a servant to the vine dressers that they might give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the vine dressers beat him and sent him away empty handed. Again, he sent another servant. They beat him also, treated him shamefully and sent him away empty handed. And again, he sent a third and they wounded him and cast him out. Then the owners of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Probably they will respect him when they see him. But when the vine dressers saw him, they reasoned among themselves, saying, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, that the inheritance may be ours. So they cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, what, the, what will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. And they heard and said, Certainly not. And so the nation, the, the, the leaders were standing there going, They realized what he was talking about. In Isaiah, uh, chapter 5, Isaiah relates to the vineyard being the nation of Israel. Verse 7, the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And so he's just, he's just using an image that they would, they would all know, that they were the vineyard. And that, that it, it, we're told in Matthew that the, the owner of the vineyard actually planted, planted the vineyard. It built a wall. It provided a, a wine press, a wine vat. He did, the vineyard owner did everything. They were just to tend it. And they decided they didn't want to give him what was due him. And so they, they beat the first servant, he sent another. They beat that one, he sent another. They beat that one until finally he sends his own son. And they say, hey, let's kill this guy and then we'll own the vineyard ourselves." And so they do. And what has happened? The vineyard, the vineyard owner is going to send and destroy them and give the vineyard to others. Now that's the point that they couldn't handle. Certainly not. It's the harshest way to say that. They will not allow that. Why? Because he's saying that the promises of Israel that were given to Israel are going to be given to another because they have rejected him. And that's exactly what happened. That the, 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 the vineyard was cut down and, the, and these guys were cut off and that the new work of God with the Gentiles was happening. That God was going to graft in the Gentiles into the olive tree. That's what Romans talks about. And so here, he's, he's proclaiming that. He's saying, you guys, you've had all. 
You've had the prophets, you've had the law, you've had Moses and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Daniel and you've had John the Baptist and you've had all these things. You have the temple, you have, you have it all and yet you will not give that which is required. And so he says, okay, he's gonna come and destroy it. 70 AD, this, this happened. And the Gentiles are the ones who for the last 2,000 years have received the benefit of the salvation of Christ. And he says, what then is this that is written? So he goes, they're saying, this is not the case, not going to happen. And so what does he do? He quotes from the psalm. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief corner. Whoever falls in that stone will be broken, but, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to power. And the chief priests and scribes, powder, and the chief priests and scribes that very hour sought to lay hands on him, but they feared the people, but for they knew he had spoken this parable against them. And so here they are, so many opportunities to believe, so many opportunities to give up and say, this guy is better than me. This guy is worthy of our praise. He can heal the sick. He can raise the dead. He can give sight to the blind. He can make the deaf hear. He is the, he is the, the fulfillment of prophecy. He is doing all these things. And it comes a point that the, the religious leaders had to make a choice in saying, I am going to follow you. Just like you and I have a choice right now. Whether we will say, I will follow Jesus. No turning back. You know, we sang some of those songs today. I'm I'm singing them going, my hope is in you. Oh man, my hope is in you. But is all my hope in you? Is all our hope in him? All our hope? Or is there some hope for spiritual things, but the hope of my life here on this earth, well, that's, that's down to me and down to what I can do. And, or is there all my hope in him? You know, here he's saying, you, the vine dressers, he's like, you had everything, every opportunity to give yourself to him and experience the blessing that God wants to give, and yet they would not. He says, hey, the stone's gonna fall. If you fall on the stone, you're going to be broken, and it's going to grind into power, and there's going to be judgment that's going to come. You see, this is what he's talking, this is why he was weeping. He was weeping because he wants to bring peace to each and every one of us. That, but what we have to do is we have to do what John told us to do, is to repent and say, God, I have sinned, and I have failed, and I, have, I, I, I repent, I turn from my ways, and I follow you. And I want you to be my Lord. I want you to be my Savior. I will give my life to you. That's what these people would not do. And so he says, hey, the hammer's going to fall. There is judgment that's going to come. And for us Christians, you know, this is what's so important about all these things. That the temple of God is the place that people want to come and meet with them. People want to be able to experience God through meeting with you and me. I haven't met a whole lot of people who aren't Christians who have read this book. There are a few, but the vast majority have not. The vast majority don't even, they can't even probably name three or four of the Ten Commandments. You know, I I did a a thing, I I did this teaching course here in the UK, and I I asked, I did the Ten Commandments. I said, how many, you know, name some of the Ten Commandments. Not one. Ten people in the room, not one. They didn't get any. Ten of them. I'm sitting there going, oh my goodness, you all have RE all of you, and not one of you can name the Ten Commandments. One of the Ten Commandments. People don't understand anymore. All they see is what's on TV, you know? And what do they see on TV? Guys dancing on a line of money saying the anointing and the anointing, the anointing. Or they're gonna meet you in their work, in their neighborhood, in the gym, on the street, and you're gonna bring something different to them. Or are we? He says, hey, let's clean house. Let's say that his authority, he is not just someone we sing songs to, but he is actually God in human flesh and worthy that I would bow my knee and say, I don't always understand why you don't allow me to do this. I don't understand why I can't go doing that, but I am gonna bow my knee and say, you are God and I am not, and I'm gonna let you live through my life. Why? Because when we bow the knee, the, the, the spirit of God comes into our life and we have peace with God and the peace of God and we have the anointing of the Holy Spirit to go forth and to be his witnesses. This is their opportunity. And the nation said, no, I want to stay in control of my life. I want to stay in power. And so they rejected Jesus. 
and they lost everything 40 years later. Some of the disciples, they had a horrible life. They struggled all their life. They got beaten, they got rejected, but then when they, got, they stepped into the pearly gates, what happened? Well done, my good and faithful servant. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord. That that well done is for each one of us who will give our life to you. Lord, many of us know the pains and the hurts of this world, the injustice. Many of us have been hurt by these very types of people that I've mentioned who say they stand for God and yet all they want is your money. There are people who have been injured by that. There have been people who have gotten into relationships thinking this was the right thing and, 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 and it wasn't the right thing and they have been hurt through that. And a lot of times, Lord, I have to confess, it's hard to trust you. We can't even trust the person next to it off, oftentimes. How do we put our trust in someone we can't see? Well, Lord, we have your word and you have been faithful to what you have said 100% of the time. So God, I pray if there is something in our minds and our hearts that we have been saying to you, just give us one more confirmation, Lord, and I'll do it. God's already given you five. God's already spoken to you through his word. Isn't it time to just to do it now? Some of us, Lord, are probably asking for something new. Give me a fresh word. I need a fresh something. When in reality, we just need to walk in that what we've already been told. That's not very fun, Lord. But God, it's often where the victory is. So I pray, Father, that if we've been spoken to, that we would carry that out. Whether we understand it or not, we would carry it out. Because you've told us not to lean on our understanding, but in all our ways acknowledge you and you will direct our path. So Father, may we live that and say, you have authority over our lives. If you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior this morning, this is your opportunity. If you reject this truth again, another layer goes on your heart and it's harder the next time. This is the moment for you to walk in the light as he is in the light, to step out and say, I have sinned. I am separated from God. You know it. You know the emptiness in your heart. You've tried other things and now you've come to this moment where you don't understand everything, but this is your opportunity to, 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 to take a step of faith and saying, Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Change my life. This is your moment to say those things from your heart, to confess them to your neighbor, your friend, your family member that brought you, to say, I want to be, I want to know God. I want to have my sins forgiven. You can do that by just confessing, God, forgive me. Change my life. If you have done that, if you want to do that, please talk with me or your friend afterwards or your, your family member, whatever, and get right with God. This is your opportunity. Walk in the light as he in the light. Lord, thank you for this time that we can study your word. The fact that you weep over those who say no. You want to bring peace to them, and yet they don't. Father, thank you for most of us in this room have already made the commitment, already said, I want to walk with you. But God, sometimes just like the temple, our house needs to be cleaned again. We let things come back in, clean it out again, Lord. You're so gracious, you're so merciful that you'll pick us up, clean us out, and use us once again. Thank you for that truth and your name. Amen.